Thank you all for coming. I'm Kathy Foley. Um, I love that I'm starting to see um, regular faces. Um, I'm director of cardiology, and we are here for you to become healthier and keep your heart healthy. So I think I've said this before, but for those of you that are new, if there's topics that you want us to present on, please email me, call me, reach out to Dr. Pangan. Um, we really want to continue to have these events every month, and we want to fill the room. So please share with your friends and family with these events as well, okay? Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Teresa Pangan. Teresa graduated from Iowa State and then continued and got her doctorate at Texas Women's University. So, we are blessed to have her here at Trinity. She works in our community outreach in cardiology and oncology, and we are working hard on improving the health of the collective. So, we know that if you have a heart event and you come here, we know we can take really good care of you, but we don't want to see you here. <laughs> so uh, anyway, you're really going to enjoy tonight. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Pink. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I am thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for being here. I am going to break down blood pressure for you in, in ways you may ha not have thought of before. I am, of course, going to tie blood pressure and things that you can do in your lifestyle to lower it without medication. But I'm also going to drill down to some of the root causes of blood pressure, um, high blood pressure, and also really get into the pervasive problem that we have with blood pressure and connect it to lifestyle. Uh, you are here today. I'm going to make a sweeping assumption that you're here because you're curious about understanding how you can prevent future traumatic events with your heart and your, and your health, that you want a better understanding of what, what you need to do to help your body heal and to keep it tip top shape, that you want to then focus on living a full life. And that's gonna look different for everybody, what a full life is. That might be pouring yourself into your work, that might be traveling, it might be spending time uh, with grandkids or spending time with family and friends or uh, raising kids. So, oh, savoring time at home. But I want that for you. And that's like Kathy said, that's what these events are about. These events are to lift up your health because well, your health is a very important wealth that you have. So, okay. Blood pressure. I want to use a um, illustration to kind of break the ice here uh, and start to understand what's going on with blood pressure. So how many of you, raise your hand if you drove here tonight. Okay, lots of you. Okay, hands down. So I'm going to talk a little bit about cars, okay? And I know very little about cars, but my dad did drill a couple things into me, okay? And one thing was watch that temperature gauge, okay? So keep your eye on that. Don't let that get up there. So tell me thumbs up or thumbs down. How would you read this temperature gauge? I see some up there for temperature gauge. So, okay, thumbs up. Okay, great. So things are going good if your, if your temperature gauge looks like that. So, oh. Well, give me um, a thumbs up or a thumbs down for this one. Oh. Okay, I see thumbs down. I heard, heard some thumbs down. Okay, so this is not a good sign, okay? This could lead to disaster, okay? And fortunately, I've only had one car that got up into the red and I pulled it over, windows down, air conditioning off, let it cool for about 10 minutes, and then I took off. And I didn't go very far. <laughs> so I eventually did, thankfully, make it to the repair shop. Little by little by little. And man, those hills really wreak havoc on your, when you have a problem going on. Um, what they found out was it was a leaky hose. So now it was a leaky hose. What if I put coolant, if I didn't repair the hose, and I put coolant into the car? What would happen? 
It leaked out. Yeah. So eventually it'll go up to the red again. And I have to go through this again. But if I replaced the leaky hose, I would have gotten to the root of the problem and the car would have driven fine. So what are some other possible causes of um, a, a temperature gauge being in the red? Thermostat, water, what? Water pump doesn't work. Water pump doesn't work. Okay. Uh huh. But it's a blockage. A blockage, yeah. Maybe corrosion, minerals kind of thing. Okay. But if we repair the root cause, then we don't have to worry about it. Then the car is running well. Same thing with blood pressure. With blood pressure, when, when your blood pressure goes up, there's damage happening in your arteries. And at some point, it's gonna end a disaster. And you can put a Band-Aid on it with medications to keep it in a good range. But that's just a Band-Aid. It's not getting at the root cause. And there could be different root causes. And we're going to talk more about that. But I want you to understand that medication is a band-aid. It's not getting at the root problem. And what we know actually is that people with high blood pressure, just one medication to control their medic to control their blood pressure, and they have well-controlled blood pressure with that one medication, they're at 33% higher risk for stroke than somebody that has normal blood pressure and not on a medication. And if you get to three medications, your risk of stroke goes to 2.5 times, even well controlled. So yes, take your medication, okay? If you have high blood pressure, please do, okay? But I want to introduce you to some lifestyle solutions that really do work and can get at the root causes, okay? So, um, so blood pressure, just give me some things. What does blood pressure kind of throw some things out there? What does that mean to you? What's it, what, what is it, what comes to mind? That we're learning here, so there's no wrong answers, but just shout out some things. Okay. We're talking about high blood pressure. I said headache. Headache, okay. Okay. Dizziness, okay. These are some things that, yes, can happen, but it's also silent. So that's why it's just it really, we can, it's easy to ignore. Okay, so, um, oh, some other alarming stats here. Um, blood pressure is number one diagnosis in the world. Medical diagnosis, it's the number one prescription brand for men. 47%, uh, we're the highest nation in the world for blood pressure, high blood pressure, almost half. 20% of those people don't even know that they have high blood pressure. And half of people aren't controlling, with high blood pressure, aren't controlling it well, managing it well. Okay, so blood pressure. So your heart um, is, is, its main role is to, to push blood throughout your arteries, okay? Your arteries need nutrients, oxygen, and all kinds of stuff to keep alive and keep up with your life. Now, your heart pumps 100,000 times a day to keep up at minimum. And it pumps through the arteries, the hoses, essentially, that you have that lead out of the heart and all to different parts, and they get smaller. And, we, and your whole artery, vessel, and vein network is 60,000 miles. 60,000 miles that your heart has to somehow push the blood around. And it does this through creating pressure. So blood pressure is the pressure ejected out of your heart. That's the top number, the systolic. So that's your highest pressure right out of the heart because you gotta go 60,000 miles then from there. And then the diastolic, the number on the bottom is the pause or the rest 
between pushes. Make sense? Okay, so that's your blood pressure reading. Okay, so let's look at some numbers for what we want to aim for. So these are the numbers. Notice in the healthy, it's less than 120 as a systolic and less than 80 for diastolic. And we get up to stage one hypertension with 130 or greater or 80 or greater. Now, most of us are going to be in the systolic is where we get into trouble, not the diastolic, the relaxation. So, but these are guidelines. They're, they're out there, you know, American Heart Association, um, uh, 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 American College of Cardiology. These are published by. So those are the numbers. Okay, so those are the numbers. Um, so when you're taking your blood pressure, you need to understand how these numbers were arrived at. Because things like exercise, caffeine, uh, talking, they all raise your blood pressure. So if you do that, just know where you take it, you're not going to get a valid or accurate number. So there's some mistakes that a lot of people will make, especially if you take it at home. So let's go over those. So you want to make sure your feet are flat on the floor, your back is well supported in a chair when you're taking it, not slumped over, not in a big high stool. Um, you want your, your hand to be resting on the table or the arm of the chair. And basically what you want is when the cuff is on your arm, it should be at heart level, okay? So if you're up here, it's not gonna be at heart level, okay? So you want it relaxed, that arm resting there. And you want for five minutes before you take your blood pressure to rest, okay? So if you've rushed into the doctor's office and they're just, you know, they're go, 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 and they're taking your blood pressure, you can say, oh, you know what? I haven't had five minutes to wait. Let's wait a few more minutes, okay? Otherwise, you might not get a good reading. Um, other things, um, don't talk to the nurse, okay? <laughs> or whoever's taking the blood pressure. I know it's very tempting, but that can raise your blood pressure 15 points, okay? Don't look at your phone. All visitors visiting hours will end at 6 p.m. Visiting hours will end at 6 p.m. Visiting hours will end at 6 p.m. You don't want to look at your phone because that can actually trigger, without you realizing it, your sympathetic nervous system. <laughs> so, um, uh, you also want to, before you get your blood pressure, make sure you haven't had caffeine, uh, smoked, or done any exercise for 30 minutes. Okay, those can all raise your blood pressure. Um, and then um, empty your bladder. Um, if you have a full bladder, you can put pressure on your kidney, which can raise your, your blood pressure. That's This is so you can get a good reading. Now, when you're diagnosed with high blood pressure, you need two high readings, okay? One doesn't make it, and usually you're going to want to take one in the other arm just to make sure there's not a vessel issue. So um, one time doesn't mean you have high blood pressure, but it means you need to start taking action. And that's exactly what happened to me. <clears throat> uh, back when I was pregnant with my third child, he is now 19, going to Iowa State now. Um, and um, I was pregnant with him, and the nurse took me aside after one of my visits and said, Teresa, you've got a really high blood pressure reading, and I know you watch this, and I know you're, you know, you really try and um, keep this monitored. So that was my wake up call. And I just had had a chat on the way in with a contractor for a business that I ran, and, um, you know, it was a very intentional conversation. I didn't feel like it was more stressful than kind of normal, but it was a nice little red flag to me that, you know what, my body reacts to those kind of conversations. So what I did then is I made a plan to get out of that work that I was doing. I knew it was getting more stressful and part of me knew it was the work, the, the work was changing, the industry was changing. Um, and for me, that was not a good thing. Uh, the second thing is, I looked up what I could do. Now, this was, remember, this was 19 years ago, so we didn't have, like, quite the extensive resources that we have now. But um, I looked up um, Herbert Benson. He's a cardiologist that has since passed. But for 30 years, he had worked on and studied and used this thing called relaxation response. And so I got his red book and read it, and I started to do the relaxation response for two minutes. That's all I could do. I had two younger kids, okay? So two minutes was the most I could do in the morning. Then I went to four minutes, then five, and then 10. And I held for many years 10 minutes, because that's as much as I could do with, and I eventually had four kids. 
So, um, but now I'm actually at 20 minutes and I don't skip ever. Even when I go on vacation, I do this. It's essentially a mindfulness slash in the genre of meditation activity. It's not complex, uh, but it really helps me. And it's helped, it has other benefits too that I'll share another time. So, um, but something to think about, you've got the information on your handout for tonight. So, um, okay. Um, so I wanna talk about some of the physical things that raise your blood pressure, okay? First, heart rate. Your heart rate, typically we want it 60 to 100 beats per minute. Now, exercise can raise that, so that's, that's okay, okay? But your sympathetic nervous system stress can raise your heart rate, which then puts pressure on your arteries and such and such. So that could be a physical factor. Blood volume, blood volume, okay? If you've got more blood to push, then you're going to, it's gonna be harder on your arteries, okay? Harder on your heart. So what is it that we um, sprinkle on top of French fries and that we're about at 3,400 milligrams a day on average of eating? Salt, so, yeah, so that in salt sensitive individuals, it hang, clings onto water, which means higher blood volume. Okay, so that can affect your blood pressure. Resistance in the blood vessels. Resistance in the blood vessels has to do with how flexible um, the blood vessels are. So kind of like a balloon when you press on it. And what I've done here, because it's really important to understand resistance, um, is I have a balloon here. And so when you press the balloon, you know, it comes back into shape. Okay, that's low resistance. Okay, that's not gonna end up with high blood pressure. But, okay, I had fun this morning and I did some paper mache here and you know how that is more brittle and it doesn't come back as well. So that is high resistance and that's gonna end up with high blood pressure. And so I'm actually going to, I did a little balloon so you could pass this around. And I know you understand the concept, but I really want you to feel it. Aesthetically feel it. I want you to squeeze and learn to think, this is a healthy artery. And this is one that, this is what happens over time. So go ahead and pass those around. So hopefully those will pass around. I got the big ones that pass. So that's how I made the little ones. So, okay. So um, resistance in the, uh, in the blood vessels is from scarring, okay? Just like you get on the outside, a scar, um, that can uh, make resistance. So plaque buildup, you know, can make resistance. Um, blood thickness is the last physical factor. When blood is thicker, more viscous, or stickier, sometimes called, it's harder to push. And it, it depletes your arteries. Now let's delve into a little more into this artery because you'll understand a little more how this damage happens with these arteries. So you have an artery in the inner lining, you have an endothelial layer. So I have here to help illustrate a, a, a pool noodle. So use your imagination, it's about a thousand times bigger than your artery, okay? So on the inner there, there's several layers here in your artery all throughout your body. And that inner lining there is called the endothelial layer. If you start reading up about blood pressure and heart, you're gonna hear that come up, endothelial. And it's really fragile and it has a really important stuff to do. And so what I've done here to kind of illustrate, so you really get a feel for this endothelial layer is I've put a pantyhose on the outside here. Now this should be on the inside, but it won't do much good for my illustration if I put it on the inside because you want to see it, okay? So just imagine this on the inside, but it's that fragile. And what happens is we can get damage. You see this? This is not a good artery, okay? So the endothelial layer there is that inner lining there. And it's um, uh, really important that we keep that intact. There's kind of three things that go into a healthy endothelial layer. First of all, you want chemicals that reside there that release things that help it relax. We're gonna talk a little more about that. But you want those chemicals to not be blocked. Okay, you don't want them to be in low amount. You want them to be there so they can relax and open up, dilate your blood vessels so you can pump more through. So that's a more flexible kind of artery. So the second thing is 
the, if you can notice here in the picture, you can kind of see, you know, their cells. That layer is cells interconnected. And you want those interconnected so the junctures are really tight so that nothing can leak through to the inner, more, more inner lining there and the other layers there. So it's kind of the first protection there. It's really important that those junctures are tight and things don't leak through. And the third thing um, is we want it smooth, really smooth so that nothing can stick. So platelets can't stick, okay? And platelets are then go to clot, then they go to black, and oh, it's a bad journey. So those are the three things. So when you have any one of those three things happening, we say you have endothelial, well, endothelial dysfunction, okay? So you don't want any of those happening. So, okay. So let's talk about some of the damage a little bit that happens in your arteries that we don't want to happen, but um, um, this can happen. And one of them is where there's a stretching that doesn't come back. It's a stretching and a bulging, but it won't bounce back. And it gets stretched. And if those burst, we have tra we can have tragic events. So um, we think of aneurysms there very possibly, but that can happen in your arteries. So other things that can happen, we kind of talked about this, but you have normal pressure there, and then you have increased pressure too much, and it's it's ending up in damage, and then your body is has this dysfunctional inflammatory response. I'm just going to call it dysfunctional, okay, unhealthy. So, and then we get scarring, and we get some plaque that starts to build up there. So, and just like when you have scarring on the outside, what happens on your arteries? Your arteries get nicked, and then you have an inflammation response. And if things are out of work, you get that dysfunctional inflammatory response. And then you don't heal as well. You have a bump there. It's a little rough, or it's not. It's it's, it's um, high resistance. Okay, so it's it's not as flexible. So those things could happen, and even if they happen just a little bit, and your arteries remember, hundred thousand times the heart is pumping through blood through. It's going to have big effects over time. Okay, mm -hmm. so going back to, so we've talked a little bit about some of the root causes of what's happening with blood pressure. I want to hit on some of the ones that you know it's tied to make the blood pressure. So we've got stress. Stress, short term is fine, but when it's long term, and we're finding that more and more that people are having their stress levels held up, okay, because we don't have a tiger attack happening. So what happens is our body actually sends the sympathetic nervous system uh, uh, response where it, it your heart rate will go up, your blood, your your heart will pump more blood because it's getting ready for running or fighting the tiger. Okay. Now we don't have any tigers. We have phones, we have kids, we have news headlines, we have work deadlines, we have traffic. Okay. And remember, blood pressure is silent. So if you're going, oh, it doesn't affect me. Oh my God, I didn't have blood pressure. I didn't know that I got that blood pressure with me, my third kid. So you don't really know. Now you can watch it closely and start to know yourself if you're monitoring the blood pressure monitor. But it's really, you know, it's really not this thing that's easy for us to know about. So keep that in mind. So stress is going to the, those cortisol levels up there being high is going to lead to less um, nitric oxide production. That chemical in the endothelial layer is going to be less, and we're going to have more constriction there. Okay, some other things that can cause um, high blood pressure are triglycerides. Triglycerides make your blood thicker, more viscous, stickier, okay? When they're held high for a long period of time, okay? If they're just high for a little bit, not, not, not so. But when they're continuously high, that is not a good thing. So you want to get yours under 150. I love it, but it's 100 or less, okay? So um, LDL. LDL is a little not so direct in its way it affects blood pressure, but follow me here. LDL, when it gets hot, when it gets, you know, when you get a high number in there, we find that you have two different types. You have more of the not good type, okay? The not good type is the small dense. The kind we really like that we see when your numbers are down are the big fluffy. Okay, the small dents are what I call, they are slackers, okay? They do not keep to their work, okay? They're always looking for trouble, okay? So when they find a nick in your artery, just a little nick or that juncture is not really tight, 
They're small ones, they sneak in. And they love to throw a party. So they invite others along. And then we have a little damage, a dysfunctional inflammatory response. And oh my goodness, the whole thing starts going, it's plaque before you know it. You've got a bigger spot there that's restricting the flow than some, cutting back some. Even just a little makes trouble. So that's how LDL fits in there. High blood sugar, high blood sugar is one of those things that we don't know if the chicken came first or the egg came first. But we know that people with high blood sugar, um, very commonly individuals with diabetes, that um, they have less nitric oxide production in the layer. That's a chemical that helps relax. And they also, they, we have thicker blood, which ends up meaning that the insulin is slower to get to the spot where it's supposed to do its help with the glucose that's high. Does that make sense? Because insulin opens the door for glucose in your bloodstream to keep the number from going too high. Well, insulin is slow because you got thick blood. Oh my goodness, then we got problems. So then it keeps looping. So we don't know if the chicken or the egg came first, but we see this a lot with high blood sugar. So this is how um, uh, high blood sugars and diabetes ties into artery damage. So then smoking, not a surprise, I'm sure there, but smoking, um, uh, nicotine raises your sympathetic nervous system. So we've got that stress response. We've got um, more uh, blood being pumped out. Your body's kind of in that um, tiger fight or flight mode a lot of the time when you smoke. So those are some of the um, root causes there. So, okay. So, um, well, let me back up. Was Got ahead of myself there. Okay, so I need your help for this next part. So I want to go through, now we've talked about the arteries and arteries are different sizes throughout your body and the more fragile ones, we see damage long-term. When you have high blood pressure for a long time, eventually we see symptoms, we see things happen, okay? And so help me out here because I want to go through um, uh, the different parts of the body that get affected because they've got fragile arteries. And that would be first be at the middle and very high. The skin yes. from now over, leave the excess substance at this time. Visiting hour from now over, leave the excess to hospital at this time. Visiting hour from now over, leave the excess to hospital at this time. So, what would you be your guess? If the arteries in the eyes are very delicate, they're one of the first ones that take the damage of high blood pressure, what can that lead to? Blindness. Yes. Yes. Okay. So what about this organ here? It's shaped like a bean. Kidney. Yes. And what will kidney when your, your arteries are damaged there lead to? Dialysis. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, what about here? Brain. And what does brain lead to? Stroke. Ooh, stroke. Yeah. Okay. What about, um, now this one is going to be complicated. So what about arms and legs? Arms and legs leads to, uh, peripheral uh, vascular injury. Okay. Um, what about Yes, heart. What does that lead to? Heart attack or left ventricular hypertrophy. So those are some things that can happen. Now there's another organ that gets affected that has tiny arteries. Um, and I don't have a picture and there's a good reason for that because it has to do with genitals. Okay. So blood pressure is very involved with that activity that we like to do with involving genitals. So if the blood flow for um, the male genitals, it needs to be relaxed. You want the blood vessels there, the arteries to relax because you want it to fill up with blood. And then that's when you can get an erection, okay? But that won't happen unless you have good blood flow, okay? For females, blood pressure, blood flow is related to desire, orgasm, and lubrication. Now it's complex. It involves psychological, neurological, but the vascular phase of it is blood pressure. So 
I'll let you connect the dots. <laughs> okay, so nitric oxide is really the key one in the, especially in the one that I just talked about, okay? That is a vasodilator, nitric oxide. And those are the chemicals that we want to be produced on the endothelial layer to relax our arteries. That's a good thing, okay? <clears throat> nitric oxide was discovered not too long ago, actually, uh, Nobel Peace Prize, um, and it's, it widens the blood cells. Uh, it's a gas. That's the catch. It's a gas. It's a signaling molecule. So it's in the layer, so it signals the muscle, which is behind the endothelial layer in your arteries to relax. So it's a signaling molecule. Its half-life is two seconds. So you can't take a pill of nitric oxide. Okay, but there are foods that you can eat, and we'll talk about that. And there's things that you can do in your lifestyle that increase your nitric oxide production. Now, Viagra is a nitric oxide booster. Okay, it's not I'm nitric oxide. Let me tell you, there's been a lot of companies trying to figure out how to make nitric oxide to that part of the body. So, but it doesn't exist, but you can boost it. So, it, what it does is it takes the nitric oxide that you have and boost it. So, um, but I'd rather go with like some lifestyle things that automatically very naturally and the other arteries of your body are affected then positively. So avoid mouthwash, okay? Mouthwash kills the flora in your mouth, which are tied to nitric oxide. Yes. So both, I looked at this in detail, this is actually a, there's a strong support for this just in the last couple of years. And it's both over the counter and prescription. So now if you have dental surgery and your doctor says, your dentist says you need to take this prescription, talk to them. It's basically antibiotic, you know, antibiotic in the mouth. It's gonna clear out all the bacteria in your mouth. And that's a flora that we're learning more and more is really important, okay? So, if you're doing mouthwash, like over the counter, I would highly recommend you stop that. Look, if you have bad breath, okay, once upon a time, I used to do mouthwash, you know, talk with your dentist about the differentiation, okay? So, okay, so how, what do we need to do? What do we do for lifestyle? Well, there's three different areas in the middle pond, movement, food, and then breast. So movement. So here, the point is, anything is good. It boosts your nitric oxide production. Exercise does, okay? Movement, okay? Anything, okay? 150 minutes a week is the recommendation, is what we find is best, but I want you to just like push that out of your mind. I almost did put that on the screen, okay? Because here's the thing, anything you do helps. Don't worry about, I'm not at that number. Don't worry about it. Just do something. If you were to start with five minutes, a day for five days a week right now and increase by two minutes every week in four months should be to 30 minutes okay you see start small start something you could do if you're doing nothing right now and you have high blood pressure you need to get clearance from your doctor first but start small if you're doing 10 minutes a day just add it like i said like two minutes you just make it so easy we don't work well with big goals in lifestyle. We work great with big goals like our one-time deal. Okay, but this is every day I want you to do. And you've got more important stuff to commit your mind to. This shouldn't happen just in the background. It should be easy to do. So um, resistance training is beneficial too for blood pressure. So that's weight training in a band or something like that. So, but start wherever you are, you can drop five to nine points in your blood pressure. It's huge. Okay, so eat, you're gonna love this. because I'm gonna tell you foods to eat more of. I'm not gonna take away food, okay? I'm gonna tell you eat more of these things. So how many of you heard about the DASH diet? Okay, some of you have, DASH stands for Dietary Approach um, hypertension, stop hypertension, stop hypertension. Um, actually, we have pretty good darn good research on uh, blood pressure and uh, what you can do with foods. 
So the dash diet um, is uh, clearly it's going to drop you 11 points if you have normal blood pressure and 15 points if you have um, high blood pressure. Pretty good. So what it is basically is eating lots of great fruits and vegetables. And there's two minerals that are in there that they found. But I just want you to remember lots of fruits and vegetables in there for this little food form. So I use this in my cooking with heart classes. It's a simple illustration. You know, the DASH diet started at seven servings of fruits and vegetables. Some people are up to 11. You know, don't, I'm not a numbers person. I don't know about you, but I, I, I can't really remember numbers. So um, make it easy. Half of what you intake, you want to be vegetables and fruits. Now, only about 1% of the population in the U.S. is there, okay? So don't feel bad if you're not there, okay? But the point is, start to gradually work your way towards that. So wherever you are, find, I'm going to give you lots of fun ways in a moment. So find what works for you. So half, you want to be working, and that's, that's not every meal. That's if I spread out here on the floor the last five days, I would want half of the to be vegetables and fruit. Not every day. There's days where we're like, ah. Oh, I just couldn't work it in. So the next day, then you focus on working some more in. So the average overall, you want half vegetables and fruits. So the mineral, the top mineral they found in uh, the DASH diet was potassium. So potassium is rich in these foods. So look those over. What foods do you like that you see there? So potassium um, helps relax your um, arteries. Um, it does it a different way than nitric oxide. There's all kinds of ways to relax your arteries, but it really helps with that. It also is kind of um, opposite of sodium, okay? So um, I kind of think like a little like pain and able maybe, like, you know, like uh, potassium is uh, able and sodium is pain and they balance, they, you know, the balance, the good and the evil kind of balance out. We just want to keep the, the cane down or the able down, cane down. So, um, but we want to bring down the sodium to keep up the potassium. So I'll talk a little more about sodium in a second, but just know they, they work together in the cells, potassium and sodium, and we want potassium high. We really want potassium high. And it's not that hard to do when we're eating lots of fruits and vegetables. We don't find um, supplements actually work, so don't, I wouldn't recommend that route. The other mineral is magnesium. So magnesium is another great mineral that um, relaxes your arteries. So, you know, again, look and see if you can see any foods there that you like. Um, notice that there's a couple of foods that are common there. We have uh, spinach, we have potatoes, okay? So potatoes, a lot of people are like, really? Potatoes? Yeah, so potatoes with the skin on. And, um, you know, when you do a baked potato or something like that, or, uh, you know, the, it, the baked potato itself is great. It's what we slather it on. So some ideas here are um, salsa, this is Linda's salsa that you can get here and um, it's actually lower in sodium. It's one of the lowest sodium around um, that you can have in a baked potato or a marinara sauce. This one's no sugar added. Um, it's only got one gram of saturated fat per half a cup and it's got like 380 milligrams of sodium, which is not super low, but it's low when you start to read the labels. So those are some ideas for a baked potato that make it delicious, okay? Um, so, okay, the other thing is nitric oxide. It talks a lot about nitric oxide. So these are foods that help your natural production of nitric oxide. So one of the highest ones is cocoa and spinach and beets there. So tonight you had green goddess salad that had um, nutritional yeast and spinach in there and had lots of other wonderful stuff. You've got the recipe in your, um, in your packet there, um, but that's a really easy. The nice thing about that recipe too is it stays good for like three days easily. So, and, um, you know, you make, you can make a big batch, share it with somebody and, and, you know, a delicious way to get some of these things that are really important. Now, cocoa, I want to talk a little bit about cocoa. Cocoa actually is a great, has some really kind of secret stuff that's super great about it. Um, but cocoa, first of all, white chocolate doesn't count. It does not have the stuff in there that does all the great stuff. So, no white chocolate. Um, the best is cocoa powder. So cocoa powder has the most of the components that we want, and we want to get it not Dutch processed because Dutch processed is roasted longer, which means it destroys about 70% of what we want in there. So just regular cocoa like that, cooking cocoa, I add it to my um, oatmeal in the morning. 
Um, you want to have, um, you know, I add two tablespoons actually to my oatmeal in the morning. You can add a little bit to your coffee. Some people will add it too. You could make um, a chocolate yogurt by just taking plain um, non-fat yogurt and adding some cocoa and just a tad of sweetener, a little vanilla. So that's a really great way to have a snack with some cocoa. Um, so just, you know, be creative. It's got fiber, a lot of fiber in it. It's got other great stuff for your heart too. So, but, but just talking about nitric oxide, it's really good. So, um, okay. Um, next, these are some foods that we find that just, they, they, they're great for blood pressure. They've been studied individually and the, um, the, the research is, is, is pretty good for that. Now everybody's going to be a little different. So try it out, see if it helps your blood pressure, but flaxseed, I've got the flaxseed over here. It has some great things in it that help lower your blood pressure. Um, flaxseed, you want to make sure here's, you can see it's just little seeds. You need to grind it. This is actually from my freezer. I grind it and put in my oatmeal too, about two tablespoons every morning. It doesn't really taste like anything. You can sprinkle on salad, you can put it, whatever. I probably wouldn't put it in my coffee, but, um, but you have to grind it up. I do keep it in the freezer because any of the seeds and nuts, um, their oils are a little more fragile and I don't want to have to sniff them and taste them and go, is it good? Is it not good? So I just keep those. I keep my walnuts and my seeds in, in my freezer. Um, so uh, tea, uh, especially green tea, but any tea, we see some benefit. Um, hibiscus tea, we see a lot of benefit too. And that's a non-caffeinated um, tea. Um, you want to drink at least two two cups a day if that's going to be one of your blood pressure strategies, lowering strategies. Um, garlic, we see garlic, some um, benefit there with garlic, some aged garlic. There's been some studies recently released too. Uh, fish, non-fried, it helps keep your arteries smoother. So um, those are all good things. Okay, so um, I do need to talk about this one, sodium. Okay, sodium is tied to blood pressure for those that are salt sensitive. So we've done studies and kind of figured some things out that some people are salt sensitive. The problem is there's no easy way of really truthfully telling if you're salt sensitive or not. About half of people with high blood pressure are salt sensitive. And about 25% of those that aren't high have high blood pressure or what we call salt sensitive. The recommendation is everybody get their get their salt down. We're just we're we're, we're eating too much. It's usually from the processed products, um, so in, in restaurants and things like that. So um, you know, shake her off the table. Look for seasoning herbs. Take my cooking with heart class. You find a lot of ideas for seasoning your foods. But you want to um, 1,500 milligrams of sodium if you have high blood pressure. It is the goal that we highly recommend you get down to, and then 2,300 if you don't have high blood pressure. So this is going to help with your nitric oxide. It's going to help with your blood volume and the stiffness. So it's it's equivalent to one to one and a half blood pressure meds. Now when you combine that with potassium, getting in foods and magnesium, oh my goodness, it's through. I mean, like I said, 11, 11 and fifteen points your your blood pressure can drop easily. So a, a really a great combination. Okay. So in summary for the eating, uh, potassium rich foods is number one. We have the strongest research for that. Magnesium, then low sodium eating, and then cocoa adding that and a really strong component of that. Um, nitric oxide rich foods, and then tea, flaxseed, garlic, and fish. So find something that looks attractive to you, that looks like, hey, that would be easy for me. I actually even like to do that. So um, don't try to tackle all these. And then, the, um, oh, and then I've um, included a list of dishes that, Incorporate these, you know, just like how do you do it at the table? Well, borscht soup, I have a killer recipe for borscht soup, but even my kids love. So, and it's just full, it's cabbage and beets and oh my goodness. So, um, and those that are starred are ones that I, I cover in the cooking with heart classes. So those are some things to think about. I actually have a longer list in your um, handout from um, in your bag for tonight. Okay, so let's tackle then breath. So I wanna do this, um, we've got a few more minutes here. Um, the relaxation response, I spoke about that. Herbert Benson, the cardiologist, um, he um, originated that. And um, there's lots of research to back that up. And I give you resources of how to go and listen to um, a kind of a, a instructional uh, recording of how to do it. So, but what I'd like to do, because it takes no time, and both these don't take any money, that's the cool thing, don't take any money. Um, is abdominal breathing. So abdominal breathing is um, really cool because abdominal breathing taps into your vagus nerves uh, and your vagus nerve is your biggest nerve in your body. It, it connects your head to your heart. 
and it controls a lot of things. But one thing it watches really closely is your inspiration and expiration, your inhale and exhale. It's watching those really closely to the finite millisecond. And we can actually change our breath and basically tell the vagus nerve that you're safe and that it's okay to bring the blood pressure down. Because vagus nerve knows that what its primary function is to keep you safe which might mean running from a tiger or fighting a tiger, okay? So it's ready to do that in a, in, in a flash. So if it senses any danger, it's gonna go blood pressure's up, heart rate's up, all that. So you've got to communicate with your vagus nerve that you're safe and it can come down with the blood pressure and your blood pressure will come down, your heart rate will come down and your heart rate variability will improve. So those are three things that happen with your relaxation system or your parasympathetic nervous system. So how do you do that? Well, um, we're going to do abdominal breathing. You can do different breathing. And you can actually Google online and go vagus nerve, lower blood pressure breathing, and you're going to get all kinds of things. And they all might work. There's box breathing. There's 478. Um, what they need, three things need to happen when you do this breathing to trigger the vagus nerve to lower your blood pressure. And that is your exhale has to be longer than your inhale. And we're going to practice this in a second together. And your cycle of your inhale, exhale, that's one cycle, has to be 10 seconds or longer. Okay, so we, we focus on the exhale then. We make the exhale longer so that we get to that 10 seconds. And then you need to do this for a minute. Makes sense. You got to do it for a minute or more because you got to really tell the vagus nerve you're safe. Okay? That this is the real deal. That you really can calm down and bring down the blood pressure. So, um, so the reason why I do the abdominal is because your abdominal area is actually a better area to breathe from if you want to get a strong, good breath. Okay? It's not about stomach muscles. So I don't care if you have a six pack or not. Okay? So it's more about just breathing through there. If you're an opera singer, anybody opera singer? Anybody a trumpet player? Okay, so you're gonna breathe through your abdominal area because you can need really good breath for those two things. So um, if you watch a newborn baby, like newborn, you will notice that they are doing on their inhale, their stomach's going up and on their exhale, their chest. So they're doing the opposite of what we do. I don't know why in a couple of years we change things up. I, you know, babies do need to get breath. They need, if you want good breath, you breathe through your stomach. That's where you get more room. We got the rib cage up here that's kind of blocked some of our capability there. We got more room here to, to express our lungs. So, okay, so we're gonna breathe in through our nose. And then when we exhale, we're gonna breathe out through a straw, through our mouth, like our lips purse. So it's like, Don't push, don't show off and push it out really quickly mm -hmm. like that. Okay. So because you're going to be out of breath and remember, we got to make this long. Okay. So the best way is just go slow and calm. So when I do it, I will close my eyes because I like to concentrate. So I'll put my hand on my belly, kind of just the top of the belly. So you can um, uh, below the rib cage there and then on the chest there. So you can feel, and all I want you to do right now it's just feel your breath and feel where you are. And I'm going to bet on the inhale, you're in the chest, and the exhale, you're in the stomach. That's how we tend to breathe. So I want you to start to switch it. Inhale, stomach, exhale, chest. Inhale, stomach through the nose, exhale, chest through the lips. Inhale, stomach, two, three. Exhale, slow down, four. Inhale, stomach, two, two three. Gentle. Exhale, a little longer, chest, three, four. Hold it. Inhale, stomach, two, three. Four, exhale, chest, two, three, hold it here in the exhale. Two more times, inhale, stomach, two, three, four, exhale, longer, 
through the lips. Four, five, last one. Inhale through the stomach. Two, three, four. Slow through the chest. Three, four, just hold it. And gently go back to your normal breathing and come out. Now we didn't do it for a full minute. Your vagus nerve was watching. Might start to lower it a little bit. You need to do it for a minute if you really want to bring that down. Um, if you have um, white coat syndrome, which I do, um, it's really helpful to do during that five minutes that you rest before you get your blood pressure taken. And you will, I've had many people come back and say, I got the lowest blood pressure reading I've ever gotten. So um, when are times when you want to do abdominal breathing? When is it going to be helpful to do? Tell me. Before you, you have trouble going to sleep. Going to sleep. <laughs> before your blood pressure, before you have trouble going to sleep. If you have trouble going to sleep. Remember, blood pressure is silent. So you may think you're relaxed. But it's really hard to tell because we can't read our own blood pressure through just how we feel. So um, I do it first thing in the morning. Okay, I do the relaxation response for 20 minutes and then I do, I go into abdominal breathing just to make sure I'm in a really good place before I get up and get going. Um, I will do it throughout the day. I try and do it five to 15 times throughout the day. You know, after I've had a tense conversation, I do it even before I go in to make sure I'm blood pressure level over there. Um, whenever I have a moment to, you know, just kind of when I'm standing in line, yesterday I was standing in line, the grocery line, and I just, you know, wait a minute, so I just started into abdominal breathing. Nobody will know. Um, uh, the other last week, um, or two weeks ago, I was shopping with my 13-year-old, uh, or she was doing her shopping for school stuff, and so, um, you know, she was at, she's at that age where she wants me to see her outfits, but she doesn't want me to go in the dressing room with her and she doesn't want to come out all the way out of the dressing room to show me. So I have to stand right there. So I'm just standing there. So that's when I did some abdominal breathing. Okay. You just never know with your, with your blood pressure. It doesn't hurt to do it. Okay. You're bringing your blood pressure down. You're relaxing your arteries. That is good for your body. So, well, yes. The one I do is that at night, um, before I go to bed, I wear a CPAP and it's hard to not be claustrophobic or breathing too hard. And so I've learned that's what I was told by the heart doctor, do it right before I go to bed. So you do some a slow breathing before you go to bed? Yeah, just okay. then that calms down that, that sense of claustrophobia and the CPAP. Sure. Sure, there's a lot that happens in that sympathetic nervous, the parasympathetic nervous system response. So that's great. Thank you for sharing. So awesome. So I have covered quite a bit. As I wrap up here, um, movement, eating, and breath. I just, I ask that you just pick one to focus on right now. I know you might be excited to be like, I want to do that, I want to do that, I want to do that. I want you to just pick one thing to do because we don't do well with lots of things that you have to concentrate and think about, okay? You've got a great life, and I want you to focus on that. I want this to, to be something that you're actually working on in the background of your life so that it sticks. I want it to be sustainable. So good intentions, yes, but it's the research bears out that baby steps are what we need to do. So think about what you want to do there. I've covered a lot. I have foods around here to look at and um, kind of just remind yourself of some of the things that you can do. Um, and I want to finish by a quote by a very wise gentleman who said, our greatest wealth is not in gold and silver, but in our health. That was Mahatma Gandhi. Thank you all for coming.